Hi, this video is a quick look back at this year's Truck Race project as part of the engineering design course uh, and it was a great competition this year uh, and you can see that by looking at the scores the, the highest score this year, 2013, is much higher than the previous record it's set in 2008 the second place score in 2013 actually broke the previous record as well the average score in 2013 was higher than any other year so really a big achievement by the whole engineering class here so well done everybody uh, in this video I just like to uh, look at a couple of um, stories that stood out from the project um, but there are lots of great design achievements here and lots of great stories and I'm, I'm only going to look at really two of them here the first one uh, is about a recurring idea that turns up in the design of these trucks and that is to do something to improve the grip on the wheels so quite a lot of teams did something like you see here they uh, put rubber bands on the wheels and the idea is that by doing that you get more friction on your wheels and you get better grip and that sounds reasonable enough but it's not quite as simple as it seems and if we think like engineers about this we have to go back to basics and think about how a wheel actually really works. So uh, I'm going to draw a free body diagram of a wheel on a vehicle here. Uh, our vehicle is going uh, that way and the wheel is rotating, uh, what is that, anti-clockwise. And I'm going to draw the forces and um, torques that act on the wheel. So we have a uh, torque T which is provided by the drive shaft of the vehicle uh, we have a traction force which I'll call F that acts uh, where the wheel meets the ground we have a normal reaction force uh, R which is what stops the whole vehicle from falling through the ground and uh, we have some vertical load down on the wheel I'm going to call that V it acts through the shaft of the wheel uh, and that is usually a, a, a portion of the vehicle's weight. The diameter of the wheel is uh, D. So this traction force F is what makes the vehicle move. Okay, That's the, the most important force here. So we can say a couple of things about F. Uh, if we look at moments about the centre of the wheel, uh, the vertical forces act through the center so they don't cause any moment, they're directly in line with the center so they don't, in other words they don't tend to make the wheel rotate. The only two things that have a rotational effect on the wheel are the torque, T, uh, and if the wheel is rotating at constant speed then that torque is in equilibrium with the moment due to the traction force. And the moment due to the traction force is the force itself times the moment arm D over 2. So that tells us that the traction force is t, uh, 2t divided by d. Where does the traction force actually come from? Well, it's a friction force. The driving torque on the wheel uh, is making the wheel rotate, but friction prevents the wheel from slipping uh, along the ground. If the ground was icy, the wheel might slip, but if we have a good sticky uh, ground surface, the wheel is not going to slip because this friction force F is resisting it. And that friction force F, what it does is it is it uh, pushes to the right, uh, and what that effectively does is push the vehicle forward. Okay, since F is a friction force, then it's uh, tempting to say that F is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal reaction. But that's not exactly true. Mu R isn't the friction force it's the limiting friction force. Uh, so what's more correct is to say that um, the friction force is less than or equal to the limiting friction force, mu r. Mu r is the highest value the friction force can take on. This is the equation that tells us what the uh, traction force actually is. Now, if the torque is so big that this F is going to be bigger than mu R, then we'll only get mu R. We hit our limiting friction force. Uh, and if that happens, then the wheel is going to slip and spin. Uh, so the message here is that this grip, this mu 
only matters when you run out of grip. It only matters if you're driving the wheel so hard that the wheel is actually going to slip. If the wheel is not in a slipping condition, then it doesn't really matter what the coefficient of friction is as long as it's big enough. So from a design point of view, if you have a problem with wheels slipping and spinning, then one solution to that is to increase your coefficient of friction. And one good way to do that is to put something like rubber bands on the wheels. But if your wheels are not slipping and under normal circumstances, then you get no benefit from having stickier wheels and you may make things worse because when you put something like rubber bands on your wheels you're likely to get more rolling resistance because uh, rubber bands are soft and plastic and the underlying wheel might be quite stiff and uh, elastic. So I've neglected uh, rolling resistance in this little analysis but uh, it might be significant and you might make it worse by trying to increase the grip on your wheels. So that's the theory and theory is all very well but if you want to make design decisions then you should be backing them up with uh, testing and experiments as well as theory. And one team uh, did this uh, and did a really nice job of it. Team 3. Uh, they wondered about the idea of putting something grippy on their wheels. Uh, um, they expected it to work uh, but they went further than that. They did an experiment, a very clear straightforward experiment uh, they ran their truck at various payloads uh, with rubber bands on the wheels and without rubber bands on the wheels and they measured the uh, time taken to cover the course and they found that the blue dots which are the tests without rubber bands gave them faster times than the tests with rubber bands which are the red dots here so uh, they and they then made the design decision not to have rubber bands on the wheels so well done to team three they had an idea to put rubber bands on the wheels, but they didn't just trust their instinct. They did an experiment, uh, and you can't argue with the, the results of this experiment. Uh, and though they were surprised by the results, it led to them coming up with a better design. The other achievement I want to talk about is the winning truck built by Team 7. This is three quarters of them. Uh, to appreciate their achievement, you, you have to look at the scores. Their winning score of over 1200 grams per second is almost double the previous record. So I had to ask them how they did it. They said, uh, for one thing, we modified the motor a bit. And I said, is that not against the rules? And they said, no, it isn't. So I checked the rules very carefully, the rules which I wrote, and sure enough, it's not against the rules. Let me say the rules are going to change next year. If you're a first year student in 2013 14 watching this, you are not allowed to modify your motor. But uh, Team 7 did it very carefully within the rules. There's no great mystery about it. You can look up in a book how motors work. Uh, you can Google it. Um, and they did so uh, quite successfully. Let me talk for a minute about how the truck performance was uh, marked. Uh, the marks are based on uh, your actual truck score divided by uh, the score of the best team. Now because the uh, modifying the motor was seen as a bit of a controversial move, um, what I have done is normalize the scores to the score of the second place team. Uh, so the winning team, team 7, get a normalized score of 1, the uh, second place team get a normalized score of 1, and all the other scores are calculated relative to that uh, second placed uh, truck score. Uh, team 7 didn't just modify the motor though, they, okay. Team 7 did lots of other uh, clever things. They used uh, a floating gearbox mount. Now what does that mean? Well this is a conventional rigid mount. Your motor and gearbox are bolted onto the chassis of the truck. Uh, and when you put weight onto the chassis of the truck, things are going to bend uh, and then the shafts have to bend. This means you have big forces uh, at the bearings where the shafts are passing through the chassis uh, and where the shafts are coming into the motor and gearbox. It may be even worse than that if your shafts are relatively stiff, which a lot of them are, uh, all of this rotation has to happen in the gearbox and your gears are going to jam up and snarl up. Uh, so the, the idea with a floating gearbox, a uh, floating power plant, is uh, that it's not mounted to the chassis at all. It's just very loosely tied to the chassis to stop it from, stop the whole motor and gearbox from spinning around. And then if the chassis bends, it really has much less of an effect 
on the shafts and on the power plant itself. So that's pretty clever. Uh, another thing they did was they made a really stiff uh, truck. Um, this is not so much about strength as it is about stiffness, about the truck uh, bending. Um, and to make a, a truck that's really stiff, uh, it's going to be uh, heavy. So they've used some quite heavy plywood uh, to build the thing. But, you know, if your truck is going to carry uh, payloads sort of approaching 10 kilograms like this one did, then it doesn't really matter if your truck weighs um, 300 grams instead of 100 grams. So while a lot of teams uh, put a lot of effort and did some really clever things to make their trucks light, uh, the winning truck here was a bit heavier uh, but gained, um, you know, it was a better structure because of that and that was, I think, was one of the factors that uh, gave them better performance. So congratulations to Team 7 on some really ingenious ideas and I suspect a lot of hard work to put them into practice. And congratulations and thanks to all of the first year engineering class for making this a really fun, successful project and competition this year. I hope you enjoyed it.